fun, and free automotive advice with real-world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. While the music was playing, while we were getting set up, calls started coming in, so let's get right to the folks on hold and start with Dale. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Dale, what can we do for you? Hey, gentlemen. I have a 2014 XTS Cadillac sedan car. And about a year ago, it was left out in real hot weather, and the inside got real hot, and the touch screen falls out. So about half of it looks like it's all really hard to see through, and it's cracked type, type thing. So can a guy get a refurbished screen, or how do you go about replacing it? This would be a great opportunity to get a replacement original equipment part uh, from another vehicle. Yep. And yes, it can be done. Yep. The, there's new available, then there's recycled original equipment used available. We always recommend uh, go to Car Dash Part. That's one of our partners that we work with. And you can find that screen. You look it up by information display screen. I think there's some different terminology. That's some of the things. Car Dash Part does a good job of making sure they use alias names and ghost names to, mm-hmm. not ghost names so much, alias names, so that you can try a different couple ways to get to the same place. Like when we inventory something in our system, it's inventoried in a very specific spot in the system. But there again, we have to have multiple names so that people can find it. But in replacing that screen, Russ, what's the procedure when it gets to the shop? Bolt it in and program it when it's when it's failed. When we know we've got one that's bad because it's... You can physically line, see it. Yeah, if it looks like... Because yeah, it can be a receiver or something causing that problem. If but the when screen it's, is the thing. When it's damaged, when somebody's drawn on it with a marker or something or what <laughs> that happens you know and, or it's got a hole in it when somebody's poked on it you know kids will bang on them and break them yeah we just replace it and then we program it and we're good to go and i would say i i don't know anything about this model but i would say dale you can expect for a brand new from the from the manufacturer it's about two million dollars and if you want a one that works perfectly and is is OEM replacement, it, but used, it's going to be about a million dollars. Is that pretty yeah, close? You're, on you're, they're expensive. Yeah. yeah, your examples are similar. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but you'll see yeah. that new screen. There you go. Yeah, yeah, but you'll see that new screen be anywhere in those vehicles from surprisingly, some will be like six or seven hundred dollars, and then you'll get one that's like thirty two hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. And the manufacturers do have refurbished units available sometimes uh, on those, and, and you, it's worth looking around. But the recycled one, you're going to see prices all across the board now based on availability, but you'll sometimes you'll find them as cheap as $300, and sometimes you still got to pay $1,500. It all depends on what supply and demand is at the time. And generally, it's the one that you have is the expensive one. So that's uh, all just, the time, every time. That's how it goes every time. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Tyler. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Tyler, what can we do for you? Hi. I uh, had a little bit of a fender bender the other day with my O2 uh, Power Stroke 257.3 diesel. And I got a line on some parts, uh, but they're out of an 05. So I need to replace the um, core support and more than likely the radiator and intercooler. Would those parts from the 05s? 
still fit in my O2? There is a body style that ran from 99 all the way up that has, is extremely similar all the way through, but they made little differences on the appearance on the front end. And so if you do switch it out on that 05, I believe you have to switch out. Rodney, uh, one of our show contributors, he, would, if he was sitting there right now, he would give me every nut and bolt detail what you need to do to do this. I can't do that. But I do yeah. know that if I you know that the grill, I know that I know that the grill and the headlights are different, and so and that like that all has to go together. You have, but to, you have, you have to run the, it all to match. Course support. Yeah, you have to do it all to match. But I I do believe you do not have to change the core support. I I believe you can just do it by changing the there's a like a headlight mounting panel that goes in behind there, and I think that might even be the same. But yeah, the the appearance of the grill and the size and the shape of the grill and where it's at and mounted. And I think the bumper cap is different also to, to make the difference up in the height where they changed it. So you, you just got – get onto a Super Duty forum, and this stuff is happening all the time. I mean, Rodney was just telling me the other day we were talking about tailgates where somebody had taken a tailgate off of a 2016 because we were trying to show our employees the difference between the 17, 18, 19, and the, and the 20 where they move the logo and they stamp Super Duty in different places. You know, the tailgates look identical, but they're not. And, and he said, hey, you can take that 17 tailgate and put it onto a 99 or, or onto an 05 or whatever it was. And he showed me a, a link and a picture, and, and he spends a fair amount of time looking at Super Duty forums, and there's just tons of information of people that have done all kinds of, re- all kinds of retrofits, newer King Ranch interiors into old ones. We have a King Ranch interior available, by the, by the way, if somebody needs one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. So, yes, it can be done, but you get onto a forum where somebody's done it before, and they'll tell you, I'll guarantee you they love to tell you exactly what they did to do it. Tyler, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Make a radio appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood show. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Let's go to Kansas and talk to Scott. You're on the Under the Hood show. Scott, what can we do for you? Scott, are you there? Let me try one more time. Scott, are you there? All right, Scott's gone. Let's talk about, uh, did you get your new truck? Well, I see 2021 Ram is what he did want to talk about. That's Mm -hmm. a pretty new truck. Yeah, we've got a new truck we're pretty excited to get. Um, We're getting a new Zuzu FTR. This will be our first one of these trucks. Is that the little sports car truck where the top no, comes off? No, the, it's okay. not at all. Not a convertible. <laughs> we, we've been running the Zuzu NPRs since 2006 now. Uh, little cab over trucks. Uh, a lot of people call them city trucks, but but we've got them set up with the gas motors, and, and we run these all over the place. And we've got some great bodies we've built and put on them. And the folks at iState Truck Center in Sioux Falls here, have helped us. We've got our, our sales rep, Nick, is just awesome. And uh, him and Dutch and the whole crew down there have helped us become very loyal to Zuzu customers. But this FTR is the next size up in the class of truck. Because the one run that we're making, uh, thanks to customers out there buying a lot of parts, is over full. So we have to go to a bigger truck. And to get into a, a 26-foot uh, box, we had to go up to the next size. And we still wanted to keep that flexibility of being able to move around with the cab over and quick turning radiuses and parking lots and things like that. And uh, so we're excited about this truck. It'll be our first one to try out. And uh, the, the folks at Azuzu um, have been really good to work with to help us understand what we're buying. And they gave us names of some other customers that had used the same truck. And so we're excited to, to put that on the road. They've got a lot of other choices to offer, but that's something that we've really been paying attention to. And once again, right here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I-State Truck Center, uh, the local dealer, they're they're knocking it out of the park for us, and we really appreciate them. 866-594-4150. Uh, got a note from Gio, who's listening in Odessa, Ukraine, and says he likes oh. the show and thanks. So that's... that's where does the note come across where? Uh, Facebook. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks awesome. very much there, Gio. And Larry wants to know... He has an O2 Ford Focus with dull headlight lenses. What's the best product for that? You can answer this one, I Chris. can answer that one. I have uh, used many, and I would say that all of them do a fair job. The, the ones that are more work and have more steps and need more, you know, a buffer and a sand, different grades of sandpaper, those work better than the... It's, it's pretty much straight across on those. The more things that are involved, the more steps, the, the better. The UV it, protectant. That's the big one. You've got to get the UV protectant, and you can get that in the kit. Some of them come with UV protectant in the kit. Some of them do not, and you can get UV protectant separate, but it, it ends, it, it's expensive. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's noticeably expensive compared to not getting. I mean, it's, it's kind of like saying... Oh, Chris, beautiful new paint job on your car. You're not going to get a car cover for it. Right. Okay. But it sits out in the sun every day. Yeah, it's going to fade. The car cover is like the UV protectant. And when it, if you don't put on the UV protectant, you'll get, it, it'll still be clear, but you'll get about a year out of it. Maybe, maybe a little more before you're like, huh, I need to do that again. And there are times that they are bad enough right. that you just got to buy new lens and housing kits. Mm-hmm. And there are, depending on the vehicle, there are options. Most of the time, trying to find a recycled or original equipment that is in good condition compared to yours is very difficult. If yours are faded, the chances are a good majority of them that are in wrecked vehicles that are faded. that thing. Yeah. Unless they had just been replaced or just been redone, that's what you're going to run across. But there are some really good aftermarket alternatives uh, for lighting for those, uh, for those vehicles. And so if you take a look at the... Uh, options that are out there, that's another place you can go to like Car Dash Part and you can look and see if you need to get replacements. If yours are just too far gone when you try to use the cleaner kit on them, something to look at. And it is shocking how much the cost of headlights can differ ooh, from model ooh. to model. I, 
I had a car. What was it? The it was the Oldsmobile, right? Was it the Olds? Yeah. It was. I had issues. I'd tried to clean the headlights. The whole headlight, I think, was thirty-two for, yeah. bucks. Some forty-two. It ended up being about fifty-eight yeah. bucks for and then both of them, brand new. The Prius. Mm-hmm. More money. Like yeah. More than double that. And, and then, then sometimes it can. What can it get up to, Shannon? Well, Twenty-seven hundred dollars is the most I've paid for one. <laughs> yeah, Shannon had an Audi. Twenty-seven hundred uh-huh. bucks. I was like, yeah. yay, yay. And some cars, they say. Mm. Not available. You're like, what do you mean not available? Uh, some of the Subarus, we tried to get some for an Outback. They were not available from the via, uh, the dealer. They said, no, we, we don't make those anymore. They weren't available aftermarket, so we had to get a used part as the as the only option in this case. And the used ones were, I want to say they were like two fifty dollars a piece. They were glass. They were not plastic, so okay. they weren't the kind you clean. But what happens is on – this lady's used car, I felt bad for her. She, said, she says, my headlights keep getting bad. I said, oh, we'll do a restoration. He brings it in. I went, those are glass. I know. I, I've had one break years ago and had to put a new one in, and they weren't available. The mirror inside was rusting out. So they were both completely orange in there with the orange rust on the bottom of the front of it. Yeah. And that probably was a result of moisture getting in there not being able to drain out. They have little tubes on them, a lot of those did, that would – Equalize the the pressure and let moisture es- escape, and Weird. so that could be a moisture. There's issue. yeah, there's, and then you get spiders and stuff. Spiders, that make spiders nests. go everywhere. Spiders are very efficient at plugging up things and preventing water flows. You wouldn't think that something a little creature that small could make something that strong, but some of that stuff is like fishing line. I've I've seen boat motors destroyed from a little spider web that was over the, the water port, mm. uh, they get in the headlights, like Shannon said, they block off that vent, and they just, nothing vents. Like, what what is- animal causes the most damage to cars? Dollars and cents-wise, or, or um, cases, pain in the butt-wise? Yeah, that's a, yeah, I don't know. Frequency. I'd say, I'd say dollars and cents-wise, it, it's got to be the deer. Because when you have a, a collision yeah. with a deer. You're getting in. Now, that's, that could be really Midwestern, but I think that happens all across yeah. the country where the deer run. Big, big, bu- in rural areas, it's going to be the deer, I would say, number one, or an animal collision of any Because kind. of the cost yep. of each incident. Yeah. Yeah. And second, dollar wise, um, if you're in a rural area and you got woodchucks, oh, they, wow. will, they will cause. I thought you were going to say rodents because rodents yeah. have got to be right up Just there, rodents. Just in general. Woodchucks, mice, but then the mice get in. They can, can. I don't think you can count rodents as one in this case. Can't you? Mice, mice so. get in and they can be annoying because they smell bad and not do any physical oh, damage. But they can tear things up. But they and they can they can cut wires. But if you get, we've had several woodchuck run-ins where they've been under a hood and they will just destroy. I mean, we had a Durango that the harnesses were all gone under the hood and fuel lines and everything. They just chewed through it. They, I don't know why they want to get in there. They, they weren't making a nest in the car. They just got under the yeah, hood. I got to vote deer, mice, rabbits. Um, rabbits? Would, rabbits get up under. I mean, they, they get do? underneath there and they just start chewing on stuff. I didn't think about it. Yeah. They're, We've had all the people come out here looking for, like at our self-service, they're looking for chunks of wiring harness, and you start talking to them, what happened? Oh, we've had a family of rabbits under the hood. I mean, that's, the, that's the kind of stuff that it breaks things, but. Webbit season. Yeah. Duck season. Yeah, I think season. a woodchuck would raise some chuck underneath there. That, I, how, you know how hard it is not to say how much. How yeah, many wires damage. to a woodchuck chuck? Yeah. A woodchuck could chuck wires? Yeah. That's, you, See, we went there. We if went you ask there. Alexa that, she'll say, woodchucks can't chuck wood. But if they could chuck wood, they'd chuck as much as they could. I just call them <laughs> groundhogs. Call them groundhogs instead. And then you'd, that sounds more fun. Why don't we have woodchuck day? That's a good question. Whistle pig, you ever heard them called the whistle pig? I think I read that one time (laughs) when I was looking up about the woodchuck. I only know that because of Groundhog Day. That's not something that, that's just something you read on Groundhog Day and go, oh, that's interesting. It's like every four years I have to look up the origin of it, why we're doing this. Exactly. (laughs) 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Pamela. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Pamela, what can we do for you? Okay, I have a 2011 Subaru Forester, and I've taken it to the dealership twice, and they say that there's possibly an 
oil leak that's dro um, dropping oil on an oxygen sensor. Mm. Um, they said it was like the thermostat. It's not the thermostat. I had the thermostat replaced. Um, they can't seem to figure out what the problem is, have any idea what it could could be. What it what is uh what is it doing? What's the symptoms you get in your forester? Okay, so I have that code that comes on for the oxygen sensors. That's what's coming on. But the first time I took it they said they couldn't find any oil leaking. Second time they're just assuming that it's possibly oil leaking, but I don't have, I put cardboard down. I have no oil leaking from the cardboard and I'm not having to replenish the oil. So where is the oil leaking? I think what they're trying so to say they, is internally. I think that the sensor, a sensor will fail if it gets coolant on it or oil on it. So if you've got oil leaking internally, you might not see it burn out the back because the catalytic converter is hot enough to burn all that trip on the floor. soot and smoke out and it wouldn't be leaking on the floor. But you would see an oil level dropping on the engine. When it comes time for an oil change, they check it and see that it might be a quart low on oil. If it is, it means it's burning on one or more cylinders. And if that gets contaminates that oxygen sensor, it can cause it to fail. And they, on Subarus, it's common for head gaskets to fail and cause that. Do they put a new oxygen sensor in and then the problem goes away? They haven't done that. I just dropped it off. This is the third place I've been. I just dropped it off and had them, you know, look at what the other, what the dealership said. But no one seems to be able to find out what exactly is the problem. I said, do, is this something wrong with the sensor or do I actually have oil leaking like um, crankshaft? Something like, I don't have the paperwork because they, they took mm. the paperwork from the other place. Um, so if oil is leaking on it, then I could, my, I might just need an oxygen sensor and I won't need to have the whole, what is it, the engine? redone there oh, yeah. it's a 2011 it could be that you it it if it has an external leak and it's getting in the vent on the oxygen sensor that would that would ruin the sensor and it doesn't have to be big enough to get onto the ground it may just be real small and getting right in the sensor and it could be coming from the valve cover on that side of the engine where it is because it's located pretty close to that so they want to do though this other shop now want to do a physical inspection it's really easy to see where that's at. So in a matter of a minute or two with a flashlight, they should be able to look at it and say, there is oil on the outside of that sensor. If it's on the outside of the sensor, that's an easier fix. You want that one because then a gasket can be replaced. If it's internally and it's getting contaminated and burning out that sensor, it's coming from a, it's coming from something burning oil. In the that's engine. probably a 2.5 liter motor in there, correct? Do you know that? Four cylinder. I I do not know, sir. That's okay. No, That's I all right. Uh, Turbo or not. But the, the things we see commonly happen to those era of motors is the head gaskets go bad, but don't they first rust start leaking externally? A lot of times. Most often they start leaking in the corners. And, you know, that, and that'll seep oil out. Onto the exhaust where you'll smell it. Yeah, and you, you occasionally get that whiff of burned oil. Do you ever get that smell? No, I don't. And then sometimes the sensor, this is weird because this has been going on for quite some time. The sensor goes off. Sometimes it goes off and then it comes on. And then, like I said, it would start doing like a thermostat. So I had the thermostat replaced. But then when I took it in, they said, it's not the thermostat. Yeah, the thermo I, they check the thermostat, you know. We, so. we, we got a break for the bottom of the hour here, but I think I would get a second opinion. Let somebody else just spend a little more time digging into that before you start buying parts. I think that would be a good idea. Pamela, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. The Under the Hood Show will be right back.
car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe to our YouTube page, watch the show while we stream it live or watch it later, and join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Tom Jackson, who listens to us on Super Talk in Delta, Mississippi. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. If you're thinking about a career in the automotive field, there's lots of places hiring, and UTI can get you the training you need to make sure you have what it takes to stand out as that first-class technician and desirable to be hired. Today's cars are getting more loaded all the time with more and more technology and electronic stuff, and UTI is going to be able to work with you and get you trained so you know how to handle that stuff comfortably. No anxiety of not being able to work on cars and even the electric stuff coming up. It's going to be it's going to be tough if you're if you're not trained to be able to work on that that kind of stuff. So visit UTI.edu today for more. And speaking of places mm-hmm. looking for technicians, our friends over at CarMax. CarMax is hiring experienced auto technicians for many of its 200-plus stores nationwide. And if you're looking for a job where you can make a great living while working on cars you love, CarMax is the place for you. Join CarMax and grow your technical expertise and work with state-of-the-art tools and technology. Work on the cars you love. Join CarMax. Apply today at CarMaxAutoTech.com. Com. It, that's a perfect time for that too as as people are graduating seniors in high school what that going to uti and then stepping right into the thing you, that's a that's a solid plan i just had a conversation with one of my son's friends at our high school graduation and he was back because his son or his son his brother big difference mm-hmm. was graduating and as we talked He's finishing up his four years at the state university and he's had a great experience. Of course, he's had fun and met lots of people. And, but I said, well, are are you excited? Uh, He goes, I am ready to be done. And he said, what are you going to do? And he said, in, in my case, he said, he goes, nothing to do with my degree. (laughs) He's had an opportunity to come up in a trade. That's part of the family business of a family business of a, of a relative and they've started talking, and he's going to learn that trade and work his way into that business, and he's very excited about the opportunity. And so he told me, he said, you know, my dad was trying to tell me to go to a, a technical school, and he said I didn't listen to him. He goes, because I really had it in my head that for me I needed to do this, this four-year university route. Right. He goes, for my case, I really wish I would have done the technical school and really honed in on the skills particular to what I'm going to do. And that – that's the type of thing like a UTI or other technical schools. They're going to really hone in on a craft. And I sit on the board for other technical schools too. And that is definitely a beauty. And you're hearing more and more about that from government. Mm-hmm. You're hearing more and more about it from the guidance counselors at the schools. And I'm happy to hear that. I think, right. I think Mike Rowe, he, he was out there doing that big push for a long time to, you know, start working with your hands, get into the trades. There is great opportunity out there. There's enough young people that really want to go down the technical route. It's, it's awesome. But that hands-on stuff will always be in demand because at the end of the day, there, you can only, there are certain things you cannot easily computerize or, or, or put robotics into. It takes a tradesman. A friend of mine was having an end-of-the-year end of bonfire the other day. They had some friends over. They were all sitting around and... His son is graduating, same as my daughter, and they said, so what are you going to do? He goes, oh, I'm going to go to school for this. And and there were two guys there who were, like, bidding on his services. One said, we'll pay for school. We'll pay for your school if you go into this trade and come work for us. And then, you know, we'll we'll work it out. You can work for us. We'd hope you stay for a year or two. And then another guy was like, we'll, we'll pay for your school while you're at school we will pay you. If you work for us, if you come work for us now and go to school, you can be on the clock while you're in class. We'll pay you for a part-time job and then pay you while you're in school. And my friend's son was like, all right, we've got over here, we've got $20 an hour and we've got in class. So it was just, I mean, that's, that job market now is just ready to be 
this is a good time to graduate. Let's just say that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's good stuff. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Don. We're trying to talk to Don. And now I got him. Don in Missouri, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Well, I was just going to tag on to your woodchuck conversation a little earlier in the hour. And, of course, you the old, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? There's an old one that is not original to me, so I can't uh, lay claim to it, but I heard it years ago, and that's how much ground could a groundhog grind if a groundhog could grind ground? I had not. I have not heard Ever that. heard that in my life. <laughs> not sure I want to hear well, it again that, either. that's what you get, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> when you're an old guy like me and silly things stick in your mind, yeah, isn't um, that the way? And, and if, <laughs> if I if I could, I don't have a specific question, but I really do appreciate the chance to listen to some of the insights that y'all offer. And and many of the things that I will say as an old guy that convinced me of is I'm going to keep my old vehicles because they're ones I can work on. And uh, and I'm a frequent uh, uh, per user and and shopper at many of the self serve salvage yards down here in the lower parts of the Midwest. And I haven't yet had a chance to. Uh, uh, grace your beautiful yard with my presence just to see what you have. But some people like going to ball games. Some people like going to lots of other events and whatnot. Me, put me in a self-serve salvage yard for the day, and I'm just happy as a clam. But on that note, it really distresses me, and I'd like to maybe issue a plea to your listeners to when you're pursuing the part or piece on that old salvage vehicle setting up on those uh, those rims in that yard, would you please be kind and not destroy half of the other products that you're trying to, uh, uh, that you're going through to get to what you need? Um, those could be very valuable to another individual, particularly on some of the vehicles that are becoming very scarce in the yards. So um, just, uh, just a plea from an old guy to, to maybe kind of be kind in those yards. Uh, you know what? Thanks for calling, and I'm glad you do that. We have a lot of people that will come visit so they, they travel, they, they go look at self-service yards and they look for things. Some people are looking for things to put on eBay. Some people are looking for things for a rat rod. Some people have a particular vehicle that they've got a number of, and they just kind of are like their own little taxi fleet and they're keeping mm-hmm. parts for all of them. It's quite amazing that the number of people that do that, we've got folks that will travel between our place here near Sioux Falls. They'll go to Minneapolis to one. They go down to Sioux city to one. Um, they'll go down to Omaha to one and they, they'll find different things because the inventories are changing all the time. But I would agree with you. It's very hard for me to walk out into that facility and look what happens once we turn those cars mm-hmm. loose to the self-service pu- uh, public. As soon as Don said, I have a plea, I knew exactly what he was going to say. Yeah, and know? it's 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 really hard to watch that. But we, from our side... We have a class of vehicles that once they've either reached a point in our full service yard or we buy it specifically, that it can go that direction. We obviously can't put a 2018 Corvette we just bought out there into the (laughs) self-service yard for the prices we sell things for. But we do have very nice 06 Chevy Silverados that we take some parts off of that go out there. And then you watch people just destroy a door panel that you know somebody else needs to get the window regular out. It is very disheartening. Just yesterday, we had some young people out there that were breaking windows and uh, they were caught and they got a nice little life lesson in, in regards to that. So can't stop everybody from doing what they do. It's hard because it, it's the nature of that beast, but boy, yeah, a little plea never hurts. Don, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Oregon and talk to Lou. You're on the end of the hood show. Lou, what can we do for you? Hey, I've got a uh, 2015 Durango. It's a V6. It's that Panstar engine. Beautiful engine. I love it. But here about uh, 10,000 miles ago, it started uh, when I accelerated, especially going up an incline, it would uh, like uh, hesitate and almost uh, not stall, but it it's almost like it was stuck in the air or something. But it doesn't affect the gas mileage, power. Uh, I mean, you have to let off and then accelerate again to kind of get past it. But every time I talk to uh, like a dealer or something, oh, bring it in and we got to do a diagnostic and we got to open up your engine. And I did get a, on the uh, code, it would, it was saying it was on six, uh, 
the six cylinder, which is way back up underneath there, not fun to get to. So when I did change the plugs, I switched out the uh, ejector from the sixth and put it on the first one so it would be easy to easier to get to. But it doesn't really seem to make much difference. So I thought I'd throw that to you guys and see what if you'd ever heard of it before. I, I'm a little nervous about what you got going on there from a personal experience of my own. I just, I really okay. am a little nervous. And that, and then I'm just going to say this so you keep it in the back of your mind what could be happening. I had a 17 okay. Wrang, Wrangler, my wife and I had, and we were having some. Yeah, you get a, you get a uh, check engine light for misfire? I, I have. And what we found, they went in, we, we the first time, we're under warranty, so we go in and we check it out, and they're like, you know what? You got a bad coil. And, uh, you know, on that cylinder. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, it's right. plausible. Let's put a coil on it, put a, put a wire on it. Let's, let's do that. And uh, it came back in again and the same thing happened. And I said, guys, uh, should we be thinking about something else here other than a coil? Um, what's that spark plug look like? Should we check that cylinder? And after a little bit of back and forth, they went a little deeper and pulled the plug and, and, found that plug was a little bit oil fouled uh, in that cylinder. It just looked different. And so then they, they, did a, a leak okay. down, they did a leak down test and found that that cylinder had a burned valve, uh, a valve problem. And we've seen a little bit of this on that motor, and it is a really good engine when, it, when it's running smooth. Uh, and so they, at that time, didn't have another cylinder head available in the country, which told me something. Uh-oh. And so they did put a different motor in my vehicle under warranty. And so I just, like I said, we, I think we went two or three times of them thinking and trying to get rid of a misfire. It was, I think it was the second time when they decided to check the cylinder. So I'm just going to tell you if you, if, if that seems to be a repeat problem in the same cylinder, check the cylinder. Yeah. Just okay. have, have them do a leak down test on that cylinder. And then I'm going to get off of that. Now, Russ, okay. can you tell him what else it could be? Because that was my personal experience, and I think it was the same well, cylinder. You got to. We first start off with switching the coil, the plug, the injector to a cylinder next to okay, it. Yeah. And if it does not follow, if that other cylinder now works just fine and the, that number six is still missing, yeah, it's got to be in the cylinder. Then we go, we're going to check, we're going to check uh, leak down and compression in that cylinder and also what it looks like. You know, if we notice that that plug is falling a little bit, because we have, like you said, Shannon, we've seen a number of these that have come through that have had bigger issues with them. And I think it was about a month than when the second one came back. So it wasn't like right away. It took a little bit for it to, to set the code again. But there you and, go. The, yeah. And then you forgot. I just oh. don't want him to ignore it because it, it's frustrating because you start spending a bunch of money and you're getting mad at people and why can't you find this? And sometimes you just got to pause and say, all right, let's check, let's check some more stuff here. Lou, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150 from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. Let's talk to Corey in Idaho. Corey, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you, Corey? Well, good morning, guys. Um, so I've got a 91 Chevy Scottsdale, the K1500 plain Jane truck. Um, I was in the middle of a thousand or 3,000 mile road trip. Um, I was about 1,000 miles in or so and started experiencing it first off with hot start issues. Um, over the course of the next day or two, it became all times when he started. It would always start, but it surged and rough idle and up and down and up and down. It would eventually smooth out at a high idle, um, stumble a little bit on acceleration, but once you got going, it was fine. Kind of acting like a vacuum leak. I tried everything I could find, man. You know, you, you spray carb cleaner all over the place. You try this, you try that, you pinch this hose, you check everything. Could not find anything. Well, I'm in the middle of a road trip. I've got basic tools. I'm at my family's house. My dad has basic tools talking to local uh, shops that nobody's got room to fit me in, and I've, you know, I've got to be home in a week. <laughs> so I'm trying and trying and trying to figure it out, and I actually did finally figure it out. Um, and I don't know if you guys want to throw in your guesses or you just want me to share <laughs> Well, I was wondering where we are going here, if you want us to tell you. First of all, I commend you. Did you say a 3,000-mile road trip? Did I yeah, yeah, 3,030 miles. With a ninety-one, I'm in. Pr- I'm. I'm proud of you. You got. You. You obviously thought this vehicle a lot of it when you took off. Okay. So the other little tip of information is right now it's sitting at my house with just short of sixty-seven thousand miles on. So very low mileage like, vehicle. This, this even makes it's more. A very pl- low mileage. Vehicle. This makes even more plausible some of the things we see with that. Russ, were you? What, were you thinking like the EGR system? Yeah, that's definitely one thing that could be a. A big issue on these trucks is the EGR system that acting up. Um, yeah. Distributors too. We replace the entire distributor on these regularly as a tune-up item. They're pretty cheap. You can buy the whole unit. So what he knows. So let's not go too long here. What'd you find? And, well, I wanted to mention that was mentioned to me by a couple of good local mechanics that have experienced too, but it wasn't either of those. And it goes to low mile trucks. A lot of these things are being put back on the road. It wasn't the fuel pump. It was the three-inch piece, the 25-cent piece of hose between the pump and the hard line going up to the tank. Cracked up, inside up the tank. pulling air in there when you shut it, it had off. A split. It, had a, it had a split, so it was self-regulating. I didn't have enough fuel pressure, and I had no way to test fuel pressure. Yeah, and if I yeah, had that tool with me. There's no, there's no <laughs> connector on there for that. You've got to take the filter off or, you know, to get in there and test it on yours. You don't have a Schrader valve to test pressure, do you? Nope, exactly. And none of the shops had that either. That's where I was. So I wasn't able to test fuel pressure, but I, well, I decided, you know what? Do the tank, do the pump. They're not that expensive, you know, the whole bit, and found that split in the line. Oh, man. Now, Russ, in that situation with that truck, would it have ran good when the tank was full? If it was, well, it'll it's run still going to push off because pressure. It's, it's only 9 to 14 pounds of pressure in there. So, yeah, if it's up completely full, it'll run better than when it's low. It may not run at all when it's low. Right, then it's going to start some, cavitating, and you might just suck air and no fuel. Right, and that'll confuse some people. But once it's um, once it's low, it's yeah, it's going to pull air in as well. And when you shut the key off, it's going to bleed down into the tank if it's down close to that so, level. So, what part of the country were you in when when this uh, problem happened? I was in northern Minnesota. Uh, I was in North Dakota when it first manifested, but I was in Minnesota and visiting, and now I'm back in Idaho after I replaced that. Well, I did. A, I went ahead and placed a pump. Once you're in there, you don't just do a piece of fuel line. So did pump. you go? So did you go to Northern it, Minnesota via Florida? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at Montana, I don't know if you've ever been there, but I can drive 800 miles from here and still be in it. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've made the I've made the trip from from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, way on the eastern side, all the way out to Oceanside. California, which is on the California yeah, Oregon border. My wife and border. I made that drive too. It's that's quite a jaunt. It's pretty once you get you know to a certain point, but boy, it just goes on and on yeah. and on. <laughs> you look at the map and you say, "Oh, it's it's only two inches. It's less than that. You know, it's the same or more than two inches to go to Texas, right?" Uh, uh, 
but it's not a straight shot. <laughs> yeah. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I I burned yep. my ears in Montana. I just did the. Uh, we were <laughs> we, the top up. <laughs> we were driving my '91 Trans Am convertible. I can imagine. And and uh, I burned my ears because I forgot. Just sitting there, <laughs> just the whole sitting there thing. driving across Montana. We drove uh, on one of our road trips. One of uh, me and my daughter's road trips. We went to the Grand Canyon on our way back from California, and it was an hour from the interstate to the park we went to at the Grand Canyon. And I thought, well, I don't want to go back an hour south. I don't want to take an, you know, I don't want to use up another hour just going back where we were. I'll just take this little road that goes right along the rim of the canyon and it'll get us right up to where we need to be. It's only, it's that only long. this much on the map. It was about nine hours. I lost about eight hours. I would have so skipped who took if I responsibility just for that. Uh, she was like 11, so, <laughs> so it was, it was all me. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing back there? Scenic, right? What are you, what are you looking, look out the window. There's another rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, time, time that, that, the desert. Time stands still. It takes, your, so takes this, some time to get okay, there. Okay, is he, is he still on? Yeah, Corey, Corey you're still there, right? I got to know a little bit about more, yeah. I got to know a little yeah. more about this truck. Um, you know, we always okay. play this game guessing what color it is, so we're going to guess what color this truck is, And but you got to tell me first, for some reason... Yeah. Is this a half ton, a three quarter ton, a, a one ton? What is this? It is a half ton Scottsdale. So it is rubber floor mats. Uh, I believe the only options it came with was uh, the locking rear and cruise control. Okay, so it's kind of like a fleet truck. Oh, it's, I, it's white is too easy, but I'm going to do it anyway. Oh, Chris, what do you think? I think a light yellow, tan, something in, the, in that line. Silver gray. It is. It was blue. It is now half primer, half blue. Okay. <laughs> oh, that would not have been any of our guesses. The half primer so it's part, kind of silver. Yep. With the low miles, I would have not <laughs> guessed. I would not have guessed half primer. I think the blue is the only thing that counts. Right. Right. So it's well, the, it's just because it sat outside enough that the sun baked the. You know, they had the water based paint issue at the time. Um, oh, so it's that. Is, 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 is it that light blue metallic kind of? Yes. Okay, I, I got it. No, those things were terrible about the delamination of the paint on the upper hood and roof and everything. Yeah, I know exactly what it looks like now. What was the thing there? The, what fixed the paint? When I mean, that was They actually 90s, were repainting right? a few of them. They yeah. had like an extended thing where they would repaint your vehicle if it had this problem. Mm -hmm. But most people didn't know about it until, you know, like 10 years later, they went to the paint shop and they said, hey, how come you didn't get this done? What, what bulletin? What you mean? It was free. It was, but that was years ago. The painting technology in the factories and the technology of the paints that are being used—that technological leap has been crazy in the really period of time. Has, right? So is the price of paint. Yeah, it's not cheap yeah, at for all. Sure. But, but amazing, amazing technology. Uh, the way it's changed. You know, now most of the the manufacturers are shooting a water-based paint. You know, and it is. Uh, they've got. Big paint rooms that you can never go in when you do a factory tour at all. Hardly they're they're sealed completely for keeping the dirt and the dust and everything else out. And there, some of the components are dipped and put to pieces. It's crazy what they do now, but they got some great paint jobs on vehicles now. Corey, thanks very much for the call. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Till next time, find us at underthehoodshow.com. YouTube. All right, that'll do it for the end of uh, Hour 2 for this week. Thanks very much for joining us and uh, following along on YouTube and all the places we are now. So if you're a live YouTube streamer right now, um, thank you. Like Chris said, we're playing around a little bit with the stream, putting it into two hours, because we want to. when it archives, we feel it's a lot easier for people to look at a one-hour segment than a two-hour segment when they're fishing through it mm -hmm. and, and jumping back and forth. So that's why we're doing this. So hang in there with us as we experiment. This is all new to us, and we appreciate the comments people have sent in yeah, to, to give sure. us their suggestions. My wife was one of them. She was watching the live feed, and then all of a sudden she left the room and came back and didn't realize she was watching an old episode. Uh, so it, we're going to keep working on this, and, and uh, we appreciate you, YouTube. Tell your friends. We want this to grow. We, we've got uh, a lot going on here. The podcast is well-established. The radio show is well-established. Well this whole video piece is new to us, and... And we're, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out the, the wild, wild west of video here for us. So. I'm trying to get less definition on my camera.
I want it to be 4K everywhere, but not not that one. So can we dial down the the 4K of that one camera? That would be great. I would like, like the a, uh, like the pictures they take with the blurry, yeah, on purpose. Oh, we could just put a fil- like a film over it. Oh yeah, no, well, that, that's Chris? not necessary. Is that what you want? Uh uh-uh. uh, oh. nope. I want less. I want it dark. Can we make it <laughs> green? Green? Can no. We turn Chris green. <laughs> oh look. Oh, I'm really bright now. Yeah, that's we Ooh, don't need that. You see every wrinkle on my forehead. Oh, look, no one's watching live anymore. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching, and thanks for uh, – make sure you call in. We're on Thursdays from 9 to 11 if you've missed that. I mean, obviously, if you're watching now, you know that. But uh, 9 to 11 Central Time, thanks very much. Oh, there we go. Oh, what do you got going on there, oh. Russ? Oh, that's – here. He, I need to talk so they can see some color Let's behind me. Call. There you go. It's not moving. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at me. I'm, like, uh, at the disco. Yeah. Now there's panic. At the disco. I, 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 we I, were there. I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I'm not sure everybody you sound like an old man. Hey, you kids with your rock and roll. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You hear the beat?